The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and it is a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But now abide in faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Therefore, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turn in the word of truth this evening to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, in verse 27. Luke 10, 27.
As is our custom, we do take a moment of silent prayer to give us the opportunity to enter into fellowship with God if necessary, which means examining our own lives, naming and citing any known sins, because if we confess our sins, we are told that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, a moment of silent prayer is a time of preparation to prepare ourselves to do the most important thing we do in life, which is to study the word of God, for he has magnified his word above his very own name. With that in mind, let's take that moment of self-examination, that moment of silence to prepare ourselves for this evening's message. Once again, Father, we are grateful and thankful that we have the opportunity to gather together with members of the royal family. We are grateful for another day to be alive. And as a few of us have experienced the death of loved ones and friends and family members, may this just be a time of recalling the fact that we are still alive and we are still called to grow in your grace and in your knowledge. May we take the information that's about to be taught this evening and may God the Holy Spirit, who is our true mentor and our teacher, Challenge us with this information, for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our precious Lord and Savior. Amen. Once again, as we continue in our recap of the year 2014, we are now ready for the month of May. We've already seen January, February, March, and April. Now we're ready for the month of May. Friday evening, we'll come to the half point with the month of June. But May basically dealt with, if you went back and you saw the titles in the month of May 2014, you would find out that May basically dealt with the category of the love of God. In fact, it actually dealt with agape love in three particular areas. We saw, number one, divine love with us what that's all about, how to develop it, and how, to, how it becomes manifested to us in our personal lives. Then number two, we saw divine love manifested in the six trials. For those of you who were here, you will recall the six trials that were basically five out of six were totally unfair and unjust. Then number three, we saw divine love in the seven sayings on the cross. Now because of the importance of the subject and the fact that we uh, just got through with Luke 22, 44 and Psalm 22, both of which revealed our Lord's love for us, this evening I have decided to choose the fact that we have to understand our love toward God, our love toward Him, our love, love toward ourselves, and our love toward others. And therefore we begin in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, with the most important commandment that the Lord has ever given to mankind. In the Old Testament, it was important as the number one commandment. It's the same thing in the New. In Luke 10, 27, we read in that very popular verse, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart the place that you do your thinking, with all your soul, the different areas, the five aspects of the soul, with all your strength, putting all your effort into love for God and love for others, and with all of your mind. The mind is the place that you first perceive a principle as a doctrine before it is metabolized and transferred to the heart, the right lobe. And then, of course, the result of loving God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and loving yourself is the last part of verse 27. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So we begin this evening with a very important principle that you've heard throughout the years, and we really focused in on this last May. The word for love is that word agapao, A-G-A-P-A-O. And it's a tremendous adjective that is used throughout the word of God. It refers to a mental attitude love. It does not refer to feelings, nor does it refer to emotion. It refers to a mental attitude, the way you think of others, the way you think of yourself, the way you think about God. So agapao refers to a mental attitude love based upon the maximum amount of doctrine resident in your soul. The more doctrine you have resident in your soul, the more ability you have to love with the love of God. So we begin with the fact that although many times love and involves emotion, that is not the biblical definition of love. That's why if you go to Philippians, go to Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. The tremendous biblical definition of love is actually given in two basic passages, both of which were written by the Apostle Paul. 
The first one is Philippians chapter 1 in verse 9. This is where a lot of believers fail because a lot of believers do not love according to knowledge. They don't love according to discernment. You know, you're not supposed to go around loving everyone and treating everyone in a lovable way. There are people, according to the word of God, that you can love from a distance. You are to separate yourself from them, but you're not to have fellowship with them. That falls under the doctrine of separation. But you still operate in love toward them. What is the love that you operate in? A mental attitude love that's minus any form of mental attitude sins. And that's why Paul told the Philippians how to love. He said in Philippians 1 verse 9, he said, In fact, I pray, I pray this, he says, that your virtue love, that's agape love right there, may excel to the maximum still more and more by means of metabolized doctrine resulting in spiritual discernment. That was the corrected translation when we studied the book of Philippians verse by verse in every word in the epistle. Again, he said, I pray this, that your virtue love, your agape love, the love of God, may excel to the maximum, how? Still more and more by means of metabolized doctrine, not by means of emotion, not by your feelings, not how you feel about someone, but by means of discernment. That's why it says it results in all spiritual discernment. Some of you actually hang around with people and you're with people that are anti-doctrine. They are against the word of God. They attack the word of God. And when you do so, you are compromising biblical standards. The Lord Jesus Christ said, if they are not for me, they are against me. And he said, as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. What's missing in the church today is the spiritual discernment of how to love. You can either love in a very close way, in a personal way, and that doesn't mean for love. That means you can be in touch with people and love them with impersonal love. And then there are those you have to love from a distance. You are to have no contact with them according to the word of God. That's why Romans 16, 17, and 18 says you are to avoid them and separate yourself from them. Paul said the same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 3 in verse 5. So Paul said again, I pray that your virtue love may excel to the maximum still more and more by means of your metabolized doctrine that results in all spiritual discernment, learning how to love. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 9, Paul wrote that passage too. He says, now as to the love for the brethren the love of the brethren you have need for you have no need for anyone to write to you for you yourselves are what taught you are what taught by god to love you see, love is not something that automatically happens. It's not a feeling that just takes over your body and the next thing you know you're loving and you're in love with someone on a Friday night, then you wake up on a Saturday morning and that feeling and that emotion is gone because there's no longer any unnatural stimulants that are controlling your soul. But right here he says you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So you cannot have impersonal, unconditional love unless you have love for all mankind. That's why I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse 14. We have a word there called control. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. And here's what it says. And I'm going to give you that word for control. You see it on the board right now. It's a present active indicative of the verb soon echo. And in the present active, active indicative form, it's soon echai. S-U-N-E-C-H-E-I. It means to motivate, to compel, to urge. Paul writes this, for the love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ motivates us. The love for Christ compels us. The love for Christ urges us. In other words, the more that we have love for God and love for the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we are motivated to love others. So that when I look at you or look at my enemies, I have to re recognize what does the Lord think about them? And I have to ask myself a question. Am I going to have the mind of Christ and think as the Lord does, or am I going to have the mind of the Adamic nature, the flesh, and think of how I feel and how I'm emoting against them? Well, if the love of Christ and the love for Christ is controlling you, motivating you, or compelling you, you will show them that impersonal, unconditional love. And here's what he says in verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, motivates us, having concluded or reached this conclusion that one, Jesus Christ died for who? 
He died for all. Therefore, all died. And so loving the Lord Jesus Christ motivates us. It compels a person to go forward in the plan of God in spite of the pressure and distractions. For example, in every local assembly, it is inevitable that you are going to have personality conflicts. Sometimes it's with the communicator. It's with the pastor. Sometimes it's with the member of the congregation. Inevitably, personality conflicts do exist. But if you have love for the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know people according to their flesh. We have to know no man according to their flesh, not even Christ. And his flesh was perfect. So the Lord Jesus Christ, our love for him, motivates us. It compels us as a person to go forward in that plan, no matter what the pressure and the distraction may be. And so when we talk about God's love, agape love, it's very important to note that when we talk about it, we're not talking about feeling. We're not talking about emotion. We are talking about a certain type of love, a way of love, a way to love, a love that comes not from your feelings or your emotions in the soul, but a love that comes from your heart where you do your thinking. It's a love that comes from the mental attitude of the soul, and therefore it's a love that is based upon what? Thoughts, based upon what? Knowledge. So when you love someone, it doesn't matter how you feel. It matters how, what your thoughts toward them are like, what your knowledge toward them is like, and how you treat them. You may be around a person that you have no, 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 ad, no way that you want to be around this person. There's nothing that compels you to want to be close to them. In fact, in many cases, you have a problem being around them. But if you have the mind of Christ, and you think with that mind, and you have the knowledge of God, then you're going to love them according to God's thoughts and God's knowledge and God, not, God, not your opinion of how you feel about them. Always remember that Satan is the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he's the prince of the power of the air. He controls the atmosphere in Ephesians 2.2. 2. And Satan has so bombarded the church and this society with the spirit of hardness, indifference, and self-importance that we automatically think of our own interests first and then others second. Again, Satan has so bombarded the church and the society with a spirit of hardness and indifference and self-importance that we automatically think of our own interests first and others second. And that, of course, is totally against the word of God. Because when you see, when there is love for God, it does result in love for people. And believe it or not, you can come to a point in your life, if you're living the spiritual life, where you do consider others above yourselves at times. Not all the time, but that's an attitude that you have. You esteem them. You love them. You consider the needs that they have more important than the needs that you have because you realize that your needs are inconsequential compared to what they may be going through. Look how the Apostle John put it. Go to the epistle of John, not the gospel, but the epistle in 1 John chapter 4 in verse 16. First John 4:16. By the way, I can just uh, want, just want to thank so many of you that have been giving me some uh, great encouragement and edification by telling me the importance that repetition has meant to you because it means so much to me. I'm the one who teaches it, and even when I'm studying it, I cannot believe that I even taught it. I don't even remember that I taught it, and I'm the teacher. So if I'm the teacher. And I can't remember that I taught it. How much more of you being the student should I expect you to know it? You can only take in so much information per service. After a while, there's just so much your brain can take, especially in light of the fact that we live in a society where we're used to every 15 minutes being a commercial or an interruption or knock on the door or, you know, you get a phone call. We're constantly being interrupted whenever we concentrate. And yet concentration is the highest form of worship in the universe. John put it like this. He said in verse 16, and notice the word know again. He said, we have come to know. He didn't say we know. He said, we have come to know. It's coming to know something. It's not knowing it automatically. Just because you're born again and saved, that doesn't mean that you automatically love with the love of God. We have come to know and we have come to believe the love of which God has for us. God is love. The one who abides in God's love, agape love, abides in God. 
If you're abiding in God's love, you will abide in God. And God will be abiding in you. That means to be at home in you. By this, agape love, God's love, virtue love, is perfected or matured with us. So that we can have confidence in the day of judgment. Because God's going to evaluate our life to see if what we did was done by being motivated by the filling of the Spirit, which the first category is love, or was it done by manipulation, guilt, and condemnation? So by this, love is perfected or matured with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we shall be. No, it doesn't say that, does it? It says, as he is, so also are we. When? In this what? In this world. Right now, we have the ability to be just like the Lord was and love just like the Lord loved. There's no fear in God's love. No fear whatsoever. Because mature love will cast out that fear. Because fear involves punishment. The word punishment means torment. Fear torments us. But the one who fears is not matured in love. We love, notice that very carefully. We'll see that a little bit later in the message. We love, not we love him. That's the King James Version. It doesn't say we love him. It says we love, and then that stops. There's a comma. We love because he first loved us. So it doesn't say we love him, as the King James Bible says. It says we love, and it's a reference to the fact that we, we, excuse me, we love God, number one. We love ourselves, number two, and we love others, number three. So this love is not just we loving him. It's we loving God. Love for God produces love for ourselves because we know that we are what we are by the grace of God and that God loves us. And then that produces loving others as well. That's a very important principle when it comes to this subject. This is why God requires all Christians to esteem others above themselves. Did Paul mean that as an apostle... He should look at other members of the church as being above his office, like he said, esteem others above yourself. Did he mean that as a pastor you should consider your position less important than the usher or the one who's cleaning the bathroom? No, not at all. Did he mean that a husband should think of his responsibility as being less than the woman that he's married to? Not at all. He's just simply saying the attitude that we should have is simply one word, others. If we have that attitude, we have the mind of Christ. Are we required to have feelings of inferiority above ourselves? That's what people who are under false humility teach. They say, well, you should recognize that everyone's better than you and everyone's greater than you. That's not what God's plan is. God's plan is not for you to recognize everyone's greater than you or everyone's better than you and you're inferior. God's plan is for you to understand that you are what you are by the grace of God and being what you are by the grace of God, a superior spiritual individual, you treat others better than you would even treat yourself or as you would treat yourself. So should we pretend that we're humble and uh, we, you, should we pretend humility over our abilities and say that we are not better skilled than others if you're better skilled than others or better qualified than others to do a task or to do or perform in a certain office do it that doesn't mean that you think you're superior that just simply means you understand the divine order all of you have different spiritual gifts and you have a gift and some of you can do things in one way better than others so what do you do you enjoy that you you serve God with that attitude, but you don't think you're better than others. But you don't think that you're inferior either. You don't think that there's some, that you're that the Christian way of life is thinking that everybody's better than you. No oh, shucks, oh me, oh my. You're just a whole a humble servant, shuffling your feet in the dirt, saying I'm a nobody. No, you are a somebody, and you are, again, what you are by the grace of God. And as you've seen in the bumper sticker, God doesn't make junk, does he? Does he? We tend to think that he does many times because there seems to be a lot of junk around us, but he doesn't make junk. That's not the attitude of Christ. And I love what it says. Go to Philippians chapter 2 for a moment and look at verses 3 and 4. I love how the Apostle Paul wrote it because there's other translations I'm going to give you in just a second. But he actually points out the importance of having this type of attitude. He said in Philippians 2... He said in verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Don't do anything because of selfishness. Selfishness is one of the most overrated or underrated sins that we see in the church today. The majority of born-again believers live for themselves because they are selfish. 
And so he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, grace orientation, each of you regard, notice that word regard, you ought to regard, think like this, regard one another as more important than himself. That doesn't mean that they are. That just simply means that's your mental attitude. That's how you think toward others because you have the mind of Christ. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. In other words, don't always look at what, how you can benefit, what you can get out of it, and what's in it for you. He says, but look out for the personal interest of others. Why? Because you ought to have this mind, this attitude in yourselves. Notice it's an attitude, the attitude of love. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also where? In Christ Jesus. I like how the Williams translation puts it. It goes like this. Practice treating one another as your superiors. It doesn't say that they are, does it? It says live like that. Live like they are your superiors. Even though they're not. In some cases they are, in some cases they're not. But practice treating one another as your superiors. Having that mind, that mind of humility. It has to do with attitude. There's a, another translation called the 20th century translation of the New Testament. It states this. Each of you should regard others of more account than himself. It has to do again with the one word what? Attitude. The New American Standard, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. So notice how Paul puts it again in Philippians 2.1. He says, if therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, and when he puts that word if, he means if. It's in the condition that says if and it's true. Is there, encourage, is there encouragement in Christ? Yes, there is. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, and there is, if there's any consolation of love, Console people that console us with love, and there is. If there's any fellowship of the Spirit, and there is. If any affection and compassion, Paul says, make my joy, my happiness complete by you being of the same what? Mind attitude again. Maintaining the same love. Being united in spirit. Intent on one purpose. What's the one purpose we should all be intent upon? The glorification of our Lord Jesus Christ because he created all things for his glory. Verse 3 again goes on to say, again, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, grace orientation, let each of you regard, this attitude again, one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look upon your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others, so that you will have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So these verses have to do with being lowly in mind, you see. They have to do with being, having, being lowly in the mind in the sense of being humble. They don't have to do with you thinking like you're inferior. They have to do with you uh, actually humbling yourself and giving preference to others when, when need be. There are times we have to give preference to others. There are times that we can't. There's time we operate in love that's personal. We give what we can give. We do what we can do. But then there's times we have to operate in what? We have to operate in what we call tough love. That's why Paul says, I want your love to increase by means of knowledge and discernment. He said, I want you to be able to discern who to love, how to love, and when to love, and what kind of love you should operate under. Because there are many people that are being sent in our lives at certain times who are sent there for one particular reason, to drag us down, to stop our momentum, to stop our motivation, and that's why we have to reach forward to the things that are ahead, forget the things that are behind, and not let these individuals drag us down. Because if we do, we end up being loser believers and we lose out because we, have, we thought that God's plan was to love everybody, be nice to everybody, fellowship with everybody, listen to everybody, email everybody, text everybody, you know, just let everybody put their garbage in your soul. No, get rid of those people in your life that are fools. Because if you walk with fools, the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 20, you will be a what? A fool. You walk with wise, you'll be with wise. You are, as the saying goes, what you eat. And what do you eat? Positive volition toward God 
or negative volition to our doctrine by means of those that you fellowship, so-called fellowship with, which is really nothing more than the carnality and the, and the uh, fellowship of what we call the Edemic nature or the flesh or the old sin nature. And so as Christians, we, meet it, we, are, we are told that we have to understand what God's plan is all about. We need to understand that it means that as born-again believers, it means putting the interest and cares and comforts of our fellow man above our own. We care about them. You know what? There are certain things in my, that I have in my life. I have certain needs in my life. But I give those things up because there's other people that need, uh, that need those in the same way. It doesn't mean that you think that they're better. It doesn't mean that you're operating in false humility. It just simply means that there are times when you have to put the comforts of others above the comfort of yourself. That's if you have impersonal, unconditional agape love. So you have to put the interest and cares and comforts of our fellow man above your own. Forgetting ourselves in sacrifice and in service. We as Christians should extend this attitude of honor, especially to the unconverted in the world. Remember that we are told that we have a light that is to shine. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ made a statement before the night before his death in John 17, 15, and he talked to, his, he talked to God the Father and he prayed this prayer. He said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. I don't want you to take my people out of the world, the Lord said, but that thou shouldest keep them from what? Not the evil one. One is in italics. It says keep them from evil. Because evil, the evil one is Satan, but the evil, evil is a system of thinking. The Lord says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but you should just keep them from evil. God wants to keep us from the system of thinking called evil. I love how Matthew 5.16 says it. It says it in another way. You have a light. What did you do with that light? Hide it under a bushel? Are you to hide it in a room and just shut the windows and shut the doors and shut the shades and it's just you and your light? No. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before who? Men. That they may see your what? Good works. And then glorify your Father which is in heaven. When we perform good and godly deeds or works, you know who gets glorified? Not us but God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Matthew 5, 16. Good deeds are designed to bring glory to God, not glory to members of the human race. That's not impersonal, unconditional love. So if we esteem others, esteeming others above ourselves then describes, again, what is the word here? The key word tonight. Attitude. It describes the attitude God wants Christians to develop as a basic approach to life. Attitude, attitude, attitude. Esteeming others above ourselves describes the attitude God wants Christians to develop as a basic approach to life, whether it's toward each other or whether it's even toward the unbeliever, the world. And just after commanding Christians to esteem others better than themselves, remember what Paul said in Philippians 2.5, let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus be also in you. Paul wrote the, and goes on to say, look at Philippians 2, 5 through 8. I'll just sum it up. He goes on to say that Christ was being in the form of God. Think about it. He was literally God. He was in the form of God. He took upon himself the form of a servant, verses 5 through 8, humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Why? Others. Attitude. Impersonal love. He did so not only because he loved people, but also to set an example for his people, who are you and I. God has called us out of the world, not only to repent of our sins, but also to repent of what we are normally, inwardly, which is wicked, deceitful, lying people, sick heads and deceitful hearts. And if you think you're better than a sick head and a deceitful heart, then you disagree with what the Word of God has to say about who and what you really are in your sin nature. And God doesn't want us to be like that inwardly. There's so many people that are like that inwardly. They're greedy. They're grasping at straws. They're selfish people. They're occupied with themselves. They live in self-pity. And God doesn't want that disposition to be in us. He wants us to acquire a complete reversal of our former disposition or motivation. Our former disposition was in the last days, what does the Bible say? Men will be lovers of them what? Themselves. 
That's a sign of the last days. And you can tell we're in the last days because as never before, we're seeing people being lovers of themselves. Now, they were probably the same, in, you know, maybe 100 years ago, or maybe, you know, it hasn't changed maybe 1,000 years ago. They probably were the same. The difference is we know what the world is like now because we have a technology that tells us how everyone thinks all over the world. They didn't have that 100 years ago. They didn't know what was going on in Russia, what was going on in China. I mean, think about the news. I mean, I, I get a lot. I don't watch the news, especially the local news. I have no idea why I have to, why I have to be told by a local news station that a bus tipped over in Arkansas. What the hell does that have to do with me in Rhode Island? I want to know what the Rhode Island news is, or the Massachusetts news is, or what's happening in New England. I don't want to know, know some negative thing that took place in Uganda. But because we know what's going on throughout the world, we're seeing love for self being manifested as never before. God wants us to do something that Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ emptied himself of his deity by living in his humanity. God wants us to empty ourselves. Not of deity, but of the vanity we lived in and the self-centeredness so that the happiness and well-being of others becomes more important in our minds than ourselves. You see that statement? Look at it again. Look at it on the board if it hasn't sunk in. God wants us to empty ourselves of the vanity, the self-centeredness, so that the happiness and well-being of others becomes more important in our minds than ourselves. I guarantee you, dogmatically, Thus saith the Lord, that if you learn to actually empty yourself for others, you're going to be blessed and out of your mind. It's going to stagger your imagination. You're going to be blessed out of your socks. Because you see, those who live like that, they fulfill Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall what? Follow me all the days of my life. Who does it follow? Those who are led by the waters. Those who are led and they, they lie down in green pastures. Those who understand the Lord is their shepherd. All of a sudden their life, their attitude changes. Some of you are going to be poor the rest of your life. You're going to constantly want the rest of your life. You're going to be without the rest of your life. You know why? You live for yourself. The first will be last and the last shall be first. For what does it profit a man, said Luke 12, 48, if he gains the whole world but loses his very own soul? That's why I cannot emphasize more, and I know that people don't like it because it's too thick of a book for them, but I emphasize reading the book of Ecclesiastes that I've written. It took me over a couple of years to write that, by the way. Books take a long time. That's Diane. She, she helped me do positive volition to adopt, and she'll tell you how long it takes to do a book. And that was only, what, 50 pages? Maybe how many pages? 30 pages, Diane? 35? 35 pages. It took us hours and hours. And she's just picking up where I left off, and I was picking up where someone else left off who helped me with the book. And, I mean, you're talking about maybe 60 to 70 hours going into a book of 35 pages. The book of Ecclesiastes is over 200. Filled, however, with knowledge that will give you answers to every single question in life. And you can make a choice. Do you want to understand it or do you want to completely ignore it and take the easy way out? Because I know how some of you are living. Some of you are living for one thing. You want to hit the damn lottery. You want to get that scratch ticket that gives you the shortcut. You don't want to do it God's way. You don't want to seek and save those who are lost. You don't want to seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. You don't want to live like the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I've come to seek and save those who are lost. You're living for yourself and that's why you're never going to be satisfied because no one who ever lives for themselves ever gets satisfied. They live in a lie that was developed by the liar, the great inventor of the lie, Satan himself who was a liar from the beginning who lived for himself. And even though he was number two in all of the creation, the Messiah's number one angel, he still wasn't satisfied, implacable. But those who live for others and have that love for others, that love of God, they're the ones that have the happiness of God, the contentment that gives them the ability to enjoy every single day that they live. They wake up, they enjoy their husband, they enjoy their wife, they enjoy the fact that they're not married. They, yeah, that's good. I just got an amen over there from a young lady. They enjoy the fact that they, they don't. They enjoy the fact that they've got a roof over their head. 
They enjoy the fact that they've got children. They enjoy the fact that people are healthy. They look at the glass as being half full rather than half empty. It all has to do, once again, with what? Attitude. attitude. Good, Bob. Gratitude. It all has to do with attitude. God's desire for us is to lose our sense of self-consciousness and replace it with an attitude of outgoing concern for all. An attitude of wanting to see others grow, wanting to see others advance, wanting to see others prosper, and wanting to see others be blessed. You know, I've got people I've seen throughout my lifetime that if someone gets blessed or someone hit the lottery, for example, or if they prosper in some way, they go out of their way to tell them how miserable they're going to be with that money. They hate to see other people prosper except one person. Who? Themselves. There's people like that. They don't like to see you prosper. They don't like to see you continue. They don't like to see you get blessed. Why? They don't have the love of God. They're too busy being jealous of the fact that you succeeded in an area that they've been trying to succeed in, but they took the, they've been trying to take the shortcut. And the shortcut never, ever, ever works. We need to understand what the Apostle John said. Look at 3 John. Go to the Epistle of John. 3 John. Look at verse chapter 1. There's only one chapter in the uh, epistle. But look at verse 2. And remember following this, we will have our regular Q&A. And uh, that will be followed by our close in prayer, of course. But if you'd like to stay, you're invited. But look at 3 John, the second verse. Beloved... And this is what John writes in his latter days, in his olden days. He said, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may what? You may what? Say it loud. Prosper. I pray that in all respect you may prosper and be in good health. Just as, however, your what? Your soul prospers. You know what God's waiting for to bless you? Soul prosperity. When God sees that you have the ability to be blessed with materialism and money and finances and wealth and health and all kinds of blessings, when he sees that you have the ability to receive it without being consumed by it and without it taking you, it, taking you away from him, that's when he will bless you. But until then, you're going to be a pauper for the rest of your life. But God's saying, you can have my highest and best if you do it my way, not yours. But that requires one word that apparently many Christians are missing, and that word is what? Faith. Faith in what God says. So as we yield to God in the Holy Spirit, we have a miraculous change that will occur in our lives. The new disposition, disposition will become a daily habit, a spontaneous way of life, as Galatians 5 puts it. Look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Here's what God's production wants to be in your life. Here's what God the Holy Spirit wants to produce in your life. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. He says, but the fruit or the production of God the Holy Spirit. Here's what God the Holy Spirit produces. And by the way, please notice it doesn't say the fruits, does it? Does it say the fruits? But there's nine of them. Shouldn't it say fruits, plural? No. You know why? It's one tree with nine different fruits on it. It's got a pear, an apple, a plum, <laughs> a peach, an orange, a grapefruit. It's got one, it's one tree. It's not the fruits of the Spirit, it's one fruit. If you have the fruit, or the word fruit means production of the Spirit, is what? It's love, first one mentioned. Joy, there's your happiness, your inner happiness or contentment. Peace, peace means prosperity in, inwardly and prosperity overtly. Patience, kindness, goodness. Goodness means you treat others in a gracious way. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Please notice the first thing mentioned is impersonal, unconditional love. The love of God. What greater love could God reveal to us than what he revealed when we had the six unfair trials that he went through for us, the seven sayings on the cross, and then dying on the cross, and then finally having to say, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was the whole issue in all those areas? One issue, the word love. So a major test of how converted you are, a major test of how converted we are, or how much we have really changed in the positive realm, is how we respond to the needs of people less fortunate than ourselves. Do we love them with an impersonal love that says, I desire to help them. 
I desire to be there for them, not compromise with them, but ap actually operating in a manner that we need to understand that they need to be helped in a certain area and they're not going to take advantage of it. They're going to appreciate it and our attitude is going to be, I'm going to help when I can and I'm going to do what I can to help others handle the situations that they're going through. Why? I've got God's love. And he came to seek and save those who are lost. And if I have his mind, I want to seek and save people in my life who are lost. A major test of how converted we are, a major test of how much we've really changed in the positive realm is how we respond to the needs of people less fortunate than ourselves. Esteeming others better than ourselves is simply a matter of us expressing love and humility and thinking of them first. And you see the strength of your personal love, for example, the strength of how you love people personally toward people comes from your personal love for God. How you treat others reveals how much you really love God. Because if you really love God, then you're going to want to please God, and you're going to have the mind of God. You're going to say, I agree with God. I want to think like him. He's my father. So the strength of your personal love toward people, how you treat others personally, comes from your personal love toward God. To love people impersonally demands more ability, more character, more integrity, more grace, and more power than anything in life. What do I mean by that? There are people in your life right now that you don't like. I don't like them probably either. You don't like them. They, they probably don't like you. How do you handle people in your life that you don't like? You have to operate in this kind of love, impersonal love. It doesn't mean that you're not personal with them. It means that you operate not based upon who and what they are, but who and what you are. God treats us based upon who and what he is, and not who and what we are. He loves us because of who he is, not who and what we are. There's nothing good in us that causes God to love us. You see, he loves us because of who and what he is. When we love like God love, loves, we love people because of who and what we are, not who and what they are. And so you take someone that's unlovable in your life, someone that's a first-class jerk, someone that you cannot stand to be around. To love people, those kind of people, with an impersonal love, it demands more ability, more character, more integrity, more grace, and definitely more power than anything else in life. It demands a supernatural power. And that's why our Lord made this statement. Go to John 13. The night before his death, he talks about a brand new commandment. A commandment that they did not have in the Old Testament because they could not love like the Old Testament saints loved. They had to love greater than the Old Testament saints loved. The Old Testament saints could never love like New Testament saints. That's why it's called a new commandment. John 13, 34. The Apostle John writes a new commandment. Now notice this. We know the Old Testament talks about loving others and loving our neighbor. But the Lord makes this statement. There's a new commandment I give you. What do you mean it's a new commandment? That you love one another. I thought we were to love in the Old Testament. You are, but not like this. The Old Testament saints couldn't love the way you can love because they didn't have the power that you have. They didn't have the filling of the Holy Spirit. For in Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God, the love for God, is shed abroad in our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit. God has given us more ability, more power, more character, more integrity is available to us to love with a love that's greater than what, how David loved Jonathan and how Jonathan loved David. It's greater than how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob loved each other. It's greater than how Moses loved the Jews and how the Jews loved Moses. God said, you now have a greater love. And that's why he says in John 13, 34, the night before his death, a new commandment I give to you. What do you mean it's a new one? Because it's a new way of loving. A new commandment I give to you, that you virtual agape, impersonally, unconditionally love one another, even as I have impersonally, with no conditions, loved you. That you also, again, keep on impersonally, unconditionally one another. By this, all men will know that you are saved. No. By this, all men will know that you are my what? Disciples, They'll know you're students of the word of God. Because to love with this kind of love, you have to be a student. Because this kind of love is based upon knowledge and not emotion. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, my mathates, my mathematicians, says the Greek. My, my technical students. If you have impersonal, unconditional love for one another, 
You show people you are my students, my disciples. The word for love, John 13, 34, is agapao, A-G-A-P-A-O. It refers to a mental attitude love based upon a maximum amount of doctrine resident in your soul. And I know you've heard it before, but again, this is for the sake of repetition. Don't miss out on this because it's one of the greatest statements you can understand about God's love. Even though it's a simplistic statement and a statement of repetition, God's love is not based upon a feeling or emotion. It doesn't matter how you feel. You feel, listen, you could be boiling inside. And you could say, don't want to be around these people. Hi, how are you? I can't stand your sick and nuts. What well, happened are you? It's really nice to see you again. Oh, oh gee, come visit me again. It's nice to see you, huh? I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you know, that's what really goes on in a lot of people's lives. It's not a feeling. You don't have to feel love for them. You don't have to emote, but you know what you have to do? Operate in thought. Think with God's thoughts. It's not, it, it, it is not understanding the true meaning of agape love that's based upon emotion or feeling. It's understanding the true meaning of agape love that's based upon thought. If not, you're going to have inconsistency in church. When I talk about inconsistency in church, I'm talking about inconsistency in church attendance, inconsistency in the study of the Word of God, inconsistency in your prayer life, inconsistently in giving, serving, but most of all, ultimately, inconsistency in living the spiritual life. In fact, I love this statement, inconsistency is the only thing in which most believers are consistent. <laughs> Isn't that right? Inconsistency is the one only thing in which most believers are consistent. There has to be something inside of us that causes us to keep on going. You know what it is? Love for God. And that love is based upon Bible doctrine. A major test of how can we are converted again has to do with how we treat others. The strength of your personal love toward people comes from your personal love for God that produces impersonal love toward others. That's when you have what we call virtue. Not morality. If you were to say to me, would you like to be a person, with, a person who's moral or a person who's virtuous? I definitely say every time, I'd rather be a person that's virtuous than be a person that's moral. Why? Virtue means right thinking resulting in right action. It means you're not a hypocrite. Paul talked about it when he said, don't love in a hypocritical way. Let your love be without hypocrisy. He said that under the Royal Family Honor Code in the Book of Romans. Virtue means operating in graciousness. It means operating in power. And unless you understand that God has given you the ability to have virtue, where you can love the unlovely and those people that you did not like and do not like, but you can be around them without having an attitude, then you're going to find out how much you've grown spiritually because now you're operating in graciousness and power, and you realize, you know what? I haven't walked in their shoes. I don't know what they've gone through, and I don't know what they're going through right now. And I don't know what it's like to be like them. Maybe I'll give them the benefit of the doubt because my Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 8 that love never fails. So I'm going to operate in that one virtue that never fails. That's why John said again, We have come to know and believe the love which God has for us, and God is love. God is love. That's who God is. He is love. That describes God. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And when, he says, when it says we have come to know, he uses the perfect active indicative of the verb gnosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O, which in the perfect tense means we have really come to know it. We've learned it. It means to know, to become aware of, to perceive, to understand, to be conscious of, to comprehend intellectually. You must come to know it. You must have the knowledge of how to love. Until you have divine viewpoint and metabolized doctrine in your soul, you'll have no capacity to operate in the love of God. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ had. Why could, why could he endure those six unfair trials, unjust trials? Why could he endure those and uh, have those, uh, that attitude on the cross with the seven sayings? Why could he endure the physical sufferings that we saw in Psalm 22 on Sunday and the spiritual suffering at all as well? How could he endure that? Because he had the ability, he had come to know how to love as a member of the human race with a love that had power behind it that could endure and handle any situation in life. So the command for the Christian way of life is not to quit smoking or quit drinking. <laughs> the command for the Christian way of life is virtue first, develop virtue. Not witnessing, 
That's not the first command. Not serving, not praying. In fact, your witnessing and serving and praying is meaningless until you have knowledge of doctrine. Not doing great things for God. The command for the Christian way of life is virtue first. And this is what I want to close with. Let me give you five different definitions of virtue. Number one, we've got five principles and we'll close. Virtue always meant devotion and loyalty to your family. This is according to the Romans in the ancient world. Some believers have no loyalty at all except loyalty to themselves. None whatsoever except they are loyal to themselves, which is arrogance. They're preoccupied with themselves. That means subjectivity. Everything's about them. They have no loyalty in life. That's why I love how the, you know, think about the fact that, you know, the psalmist said in Psalm 133, if thou, Lord, should mock iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? None of us could, could, he, could we? Because we're all guilty. Or 1 Kings 8, 46, there's no man or woman who does not sin. Proverbs 29, who can say I have cleansed my heart? I'm pure from my sin. No one can. Ecclesiastes 7.20 Indeed, there's not a righteous one on the earth who continually does good and never sins. Proverbs 17.17 17, A friend loves at all times, and as a brother is born for adversity. 1 Peter 4.8 Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers the multitude of sins. Number two, I'm going to skip some slides here. Virtue also meant reverence and devotion to the authorities over the Romans at the time. If you had virtue... You respected authority. The authority of your husband, the authority of your parents, the authority of your pastor, the authority of the government, all authorities in life. If you have virtue, you respect the authority because the Bible says all authority, even when it's wrong, is from God. Three, the third meaning of virtue to the Romans meant justice or faith. To them, faith meant to be true to one's word. In the Roman world, you know how they had contracts? They shook their hands. That was their contract. They didn't have to sign papers and have all kinds of witnesses and you know, have lawyers get involved. They just shook hands because they had virtue. That's what made Rome so great for a thousand years. Number four, fourth meaning of virtue meant virtue through absolute self-control. You control yourself. You treat others that way. You don't abuse others, especially when they are weaker than you. And then number five, I had so much more to give you, but this is just a recap of 2014. For more, you can go back to May. The fifth meaning was consistency or perseverance. Going forward in the plan of God and being consistent. Father, we understand that you've given us the power and the ability to grow in your grace and knowledge and to operate in this type of love, which we realize cannot be operated in in our flesh. So we do pray that God, the Holy Spirit, would enlighten us and challenge us with the information that we have known. And as it has been repetitious, I pray that many of the things that were said would be a reminder of the fact that we do need to hear the word of God on a consistent basis so that we can attain and retain the information you've given us. Challenge us and all of us with what we've learned. Bless our Q&A period that's coming up. We ask these things in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Church in Somerset, Massachusetts, with your host, Pastor Robert McLaughlin, pastor of Grace Bible Church and Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries, and your co host, Samantha Medeiros, also known as. Our question and answer broadcast is an informal, relaxing atmosphere where you can ask any questions pertaining to tonight's message or anything related to the Word of God. Remember, no question is too simple when it comes to knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what His plan is for our lives. For those of you listening live and would like to ask a question, you can send it in to letters at gbible.org. Or you may join us on Pal Talk. Just look for Pal Talk GBC Live, and you can type in your questions there. And now let's join Pastor McLaughlin and Samantha for tonight's session. Well, once again, a very good evening to you. Thank you for those of you who have stayed and uh, stayed behind to join us. Um, say hello to our good friend Jim, who came all the way from New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, <laughs> Pennsylvania New Jersey, close to New Jersey, right? Very What's close. Jim's last name? 
havoc. <laughs> they get it right? Plus. <laughs> All right, there you go. Okay. What's that guy's name over there? All the way to the left. Uh, Al. <laughs> That's Al, right? I can't see him. That's Al. Hi, Al. How are you doing? Jason. Oh, I thought that was Al. Uh, <laughs> I know it's Jason. All right, so anyway, good evening, everyone. And uh, if you have any questions about anything at all, now's your time to ask them. You know, we have a few questions that have come in. One had to do with the essence of God that we'll probably go into this evening. But also we have uh, any, we're open to any question that you may have about tonight's message or about um, any question at all that might be on your heart. So we'll have uh, our regular protocol with my daughter opening up in prayer. Let us bow our heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have to gather together once again, Lord God, and we just ask that you bless this Q&A session in your Son, Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. This is oh. the second time this question came in, so I really, it's from joy. All right, well, let's go right to it. And, let's and I think we've start already answered that. it before, go ahead. but um, it says, hello, this is from my grandson, Tyler. Is there any mention of dinosaurs in the Bible? If so, or is it when the angels fell between Genesis 1 and 2? One one and one two. That's what I thought. But I'd like to tell him from what you know, Pastor. All right. Uh, there's absolutely no mention of, of dinosaurs in the Bible, but that does not mean that they, they did not exist. There's the ultimate, uh, the ultimate uh, description of anyone that was as big as a dinosaur is what they call a behoveth found in the uh, book of Job, in w which was, many people believe, was a giant, giant hippopotamus. But as far as um, individual, an individual dinosaurs, there's no place in the scripture that does say that, but yet we have to understand that the world has been, the earth has been around, it perhaps has been around for 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million years. No one really knows how old the earth is. They think it's 6,000 years because they start with Adam. But the earth was around before Adam and the woman. It was around billions, or maybe perhaps billions of years before Adam and the woman were in the garden. So we don't have any idea. I, I personally, my personal belief is that if you look at the dinosaurs, they are huge, huge animals with very, very small brains. And they don't seem to correlate or go in the order of what the um, animal kingdom that God has created goes in, where it seems like everything correlates and works out together for good for each animal kingdom. So uh, I think that the dinosaurs could be something that Satan tried to um, produce and tried to counterfeit, again, the creation of God. And when you look at how, again, how huge they were and how, how dumb they were, and you know, and then you look at what God's creation is all about, with the tremendous power and the knowledge that the creatures seem to have, even in the animal kingdom, especially with among apes and you know, and chimpanzees and even dogs and and uh, individual animals that do tricks. It just seems like the if there was such a thing as dinosaurs, I believe that it probably came from the kingdom of darkness trying to counterfeit God's creation. But there's nowhere in Scripture that says that they did exist, nor is there anywhere in Scripture that says that they did not. Okay. She goes on to ask, um, also I have a question about Christian debt counseling. Is it, is it a bad thing to do if you are a small business and it failed and you call a debt settlement company? This question is from me, not my grandson. All right. Well, that, that's a question that uh, Jim and I, Jim who's from Pennsylvania, and I actually talked about on the way down. Uh, many of you heard the story about an individual who uh, was, uh, he was in a place where he was going to drown. And God sent a boat to try to rescue him. He said, no, I'm waiting for God. Then he sent a helicopter or something. He said, no, I'm waiting for God. And then he sent another means of rescue. And he said, no, I'm waiting for God. Then he died. And when he went to heaven, God said, he said, how come you didn't rescue me? And he said, I sent you uh, a boat. I sent you a helicopter. And I sent you whatever the other means was. And you rejected the means that I sent you. Now, how does that apply to the answer? God has given us the medical field to help take care of us in the medical realm. God has given us people that are, you know, experts in, what, in debt, for example, how to handle the finances. We need to take advantage of that which God has provided rather than wait for God to actually perform a miracle and uh, say, well, I'm going to use, like we, I talked to Jim, prayer is not a problem-solving device. So you cannot say, I pray you get me out of this debt situation to God and expect him to get out of it. He, he has risen up people who are experts in certain areas, like in the medical field. I go to a doctor. I don't wait for Jesus to heal me. 
I go to, um, you know, for financial help, I'll go to a banker. You'll go to someone in your, your particular, you know, role, what you're looking for. So if you go to someone that's going to help you get out of debt, do it. Take advantage of what God has given you. Just make sure you operate under his, you know, rules and regulations and don't cheat. But take advantage of that which God has provided. You do kind of wait for Jesus to heal you, though. But you oh, yeah, use I'm the always, means that he's given I, I believe he's already healed me in areas because I've, like, I, feel, I feel a lot healthier right now than I did uh, last year. And I believe that most of that has come from the prayers of my local assembly, those that are face-to-face -face and non-face-to-face. -face. And whenever I talk about this, I keep on saying, please keep on continuing to pray for me because I know that that ultimately is going to be the reason why I'm being strengthened. And I always need that prayer. But we need to learn to take advantage of what they call the unrighteous mammon. Even though it seems like an un, you know a not a godly term, it means take advantage of the the, uh, the, the individuals God has provided to take care of you in your particular realm. I always like to use this, uh, this, um, you know, this illustration. Do you want a person who's um, a Buddhist, but who's the master at a heart transplant, or do you want a Pentecostal who says, praise the Lord, I'll speak in tongues when I'm doing a heart transplant to operate on you? I'd rather not be on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you'd rather, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Go with what God has provided. There's nothing wrong with that. So that's the answer to that. Next. Any questions or comments? Raise your hand. Anyone out there in, in uh, congregation land at all? There's a question that came in from okay. your book, You Must Be Born Again. I actually had to check it out for myself because um, it's the first time that I've heard it. Uh, but it talks about uh, Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And in your book, you actually say that when he was talking to Nicodemus, he was on earth and in heaven. Yes. How is that? Because he was on earth as a member of Alex. You want to answer that, Alex? Can you answer that? You can, but you don't want to? He was on earth, but he was in heaven. Give, give the microphone to Alex because he's been studying. How could Jesus be on earth and in heaven? It's from John 3, 11 <laughs> yep. 13. Go ahead, Alex. See how much we got. Um, so he could be in the hypostatic union. He was acting in both deities at the same time, not mixed together, but both acting 100% in each deity at the same time. You are in each nature. Yes, in each nature. So on earth, what was he? On earth, he was acting in his human nature. And his deity. And his deity. And in, he and in heaven, he was operating in what? In only his deity. So there you go. So you have to understand that Jesus Christ is human and he's divine. So there are times that he can operate as a member of the human race. For example, when given an illustration, Alex, of when, uh, when uh, Jesus operates in his humanity. Um, just when he says either I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, or... Um, yeah. And what about uh, the fact that uh, uh, the Father is what? Uh, the Father is greater than I am. The Father, he said that from where? His human nature. His human nature. Give, a, give an illustration of his deity. Um, when he says, I am the Father, are one. I am the Father, are one. So sometimes Jesus Christ operates in his humanity. Sometimes he operates in his deity. But then sometimes he operates in both natures. And what is that, Alex? I am the way, the truth, and the light. And it says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, God the Father is not the way, the truth, and the life, nor is God the Holy Spirit. Only Jesus is, as the, he's called the God-man. So that's how he could be seated. That's how he could be on the earth in John chapter 3, and also in John chapter 3, and also be in heaven. He was in heaven as God, not as a human. He was on the earth just simply as a human. So you say Jesus declares that he is in heaven at the very moment that he's speaking to Nicodemus. Right. So he's in heaven as, as God. God. As, he, so as God, and then he's on earth as God man. and man. Okay. God and man. Man can only be at one place at, or at one time. God can be everywhere present because he's one of the parts of uh, the subject of divine essence, Samantha, is called omnipresent. Omni means, you know what omni means? Omni means all. Well, I know what it and, okay, means. Okay, I'm, well, I'm asking you. Present means what? That here, everywhere. He's everywhere present, okay? Right. Any other questions or comments? We have one over there, Robert, right? No, you cannot, you cannot voice your question from your seat. She wants to ask a question, she's yelling it out. 
You have to have a microphone to ask your question. <laughs> <laughs> we have one from the Pal Talk room. Um, how much time should a believer spend standing for truth against politicians that break the laws and or constitution of a country they live in? Uh, that's a good question. Well, here's what uh, the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 13. He said that all authority has been given from God and that we are to obey those authorities. And so we are, we are to... What? Can I say, uh, talk about Caesar? I'm talking about Nero. Nero was one of the worst authorities of all times and the worst rulers of all times. And when he was, Paul said, honor the authority. So all we have to do is honor the authority. How much time it takes, it does, we don't know. It depends on what the situation is. It depends on what the person is doing. And when it comes to, um, it comes to the fact that you have to make a decision, the Bible says we must obey God rather than man. So let's say Osama bin Laden passed a law and said that for now on, um, all... Osama bin Laden? Well, not Osama bin Laden. What's his name? Or President? President Obama. President Obama. <laughs> Let's say President Obama. Well, they're probably one and the same anyway. Hey, no, I'm teasing. Hey, you're just but um, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. But the fact of the matter is, once um, once they go away from the Word of God, you have to obey God rather than man. So it all depends on the situation. There's no you, when you say how much time. There's no you can't say two months, three months, one year, two years. It depends on the situation and what the person has to say. If they say something that is outrightly against the Word of God, then you have to stand up for the Word of God and not obey man. And the same thing goes through in any realm. Let's say, let's say the, the wife is supposed to submit to the husband, and the husband says, I want to go wife swapping, right? Now, that's against the word of God. So she has every right in the world to say, I'm going to disobey you. So she's choosing God rather than man. And she's choosing the right, of course, making the right decision. So it depends on the situation and what they're going through. So tell Pal Talk, whoever that is, that everything depends upon what they're going through. And you ultimately, we have to obey God rather than man. But you said tonight that you have to respect authority even when it's wrong. Yes, you respect, I said respect authority even when it's wrong. I'm talking about honoring and respecting it. I'm not talking about obeying it. Because, supporting. yeah, yeah, you don't obey it or support it. You say, okay, you know what? He's the king. I'm going to honor the position he's the king. And I'm going to give it over to God. I totally disagree with what he's doing. I'm not going to obey what he says. And that's why in the early, in the early church after Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ died in the years where Constantine reigned, um, in especially the first and second century, individuals were actually put to death. They were martyred. They were thrown to the lions because, like Daniel, they refused to obey the uh, deceitful lying commands of the king. So now they're saying, I reject the uh, authority, I respect and honor the position, now God has to take over. So, you know, it's like in any position, in any, whenever you're dealing with authority, you have to make this decision. Do I want to try to fight the authority on my own, or do I want to just say, you know what, I disagree with it, I'm going to give it over to God and let God handle the situation. To me, I'd rather give it over to God and let God handle the situation, and I've seen throughout the years, eventually God always does in his time. It's just that sometimes his timing is not our timing. I mean, I've seen recently, in the last couple of years, I've seen people outrightly lie about individuals I know, outrightly accuse individuals with lies, and you know what? They have a choice to make, fight back and defend themselves or just shut their mouth and let God take care of the situation. And the more we let God take care of the situation, what have we seen? him come through over and, and over again and the more contagious it gets as well yeah um, if they know. listen to it well the more contagious it gets within the the unity around us you mean too. contagious in a contagious good way contagious in a good way like oh, good. you know yeah. when you act and you act when you act in that kind of attitude right there you're going to show that to other people how to deal that's with a good point that's a good situation. point that's a good point little girl but when, when you're saying that right there you said tonight that you uh there's a time to avoid yes those that you love and then how so how do you differentiate between avoiding and treating others with common courtesy 
You, you can always avoid people and treat them with common courtesy at the same time. Isn't common courtesy saying, hello, how are you doing? No, common courtesy means I'm not going to judge you. I have no mental attitude sins against you. I have no bitterness. I'm not going to tell people what you've done. I'm going to let God handle the situation. It's like this right here. What does it say in 2 Timothy 3, verse 5? Holding, holding to a form of godliness, although they have... Well, you know what? Um, read, read, start with verse 2. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, reveler, revilers, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, irreconcilable, malicious, gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. What should you do? Hold, hold to a form of godliness. No, what does it say? Uh, what do you to do? Avoid what? Such men as these. So you're to avoid them. Yeah. So you still love them, but you avoid them. And that's what people don't understand, that you can love people and still avoid them. You're loving them with an impersonal love. What's an impersonal love? It's loving them because of who and what you are not who and what they are. So if someone's trying to do something evil against someone that you know is godly, you're to separate yourself from them. Look what Paul said. Read Romans uh, 16, 17, and 18, Samantha. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eyes on those who cause dissension. Stop. I urge you, brethren, keep your eyes. In other words, look at those who are causing what? Dissension. Division. They're causing division, right? And hindrance. And hindrances. Contrary to the teaching which you learned. Contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. And turn away from them. What do you do? Turn away from them. Are you to go over their house and have fellowship with them? No. No, it's what? Turn away. Right? So, are you still loving them? I guess. Yeah, because you ha you're not judging them. You're operating in impersonal, unconditional love. And you're saying, I don't like them. I don't like what they're doing. But I'm going to treat them with character and respect. And I'm going to let God take care of the situation. I'm going to avoid them. And I'm going to cut myself off from them. And Paul said the same thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5. He said, once you see someone that's anti-doctrine, he said, cut yourself off from them. Now, you can either believe, not what I said, Bob did not say this, okay? God said it. You can either believe what I said and say, well, he's defending himself, or she's defending herself, or you can believe what the Bible says. That's up to you. Make your choice. It doesn't matter to me. I'm at a point in my life where I really don't care anymore. Make your own decision, because whatever decision you make, you're ultimately going to be responsible for, and it's really none of my business, so have a good time, but you will... No, listen, Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatever a man or woman sows, they eventually are going to reap. The sad thing is when they reap it, then they blame you for reaping what they made as a negative decision. So they're under divine discipline, and they're going through, like, they don't have a job, they don't have money, so they have to borrow money from people, or they have to try to get by, or try to, you know, help, ask other people for help because they can't make it in life. And they're constantly depending on other people because of the reason that they're attacking God's people. What are they doing? They're reaping what they sow. If they would just shut up and operate in what we saw this evening, agape love, then God would take care of the situation. No one gets away with anything, Sam. Right? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? Of course you know. You've seen that. Any other questions or comments? Any uh, questions that we had? What about uh, the ones from Divine Essence? Oh, we have one over there? Jason. Don't feel like you're interrupting. We're here for a couple of reasons. Number one, we have some uh, questions I want to get into about the Divine Essence of God. But we also want to hear more than that from our uh, Internet ministry and our face-to-face -face church as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi, Pastor. Hi. Hey. I just, Al, how are you tonight? I'm doing great. <laughs> Al, Jeremy, something like that. Um, actually, Jason, you're a good man. Thank you. Um, I was looking in Ephesians 5, and I was just doing a study, and I just wanted to see if you could just um, give me a little bit more light on uh, the subject matter here. Um, actually, in verse 11 is the question, but we can read prior to that. 
where it talks about them, uh, nobody deceiving you with the sons of disobedience. And in verse 11 it says, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but even expose them. Yeah. So I just wanted to know if you could go on that. Is that verse actually, like, is that for pastors that kind of shepherd their flock? Yes, absolutely. It's basically um, for pastors or even mature believers who can actually say that the reason why someone is doing what they're doing is because of A, B, C, D, and E. And there is a time that we have the right to expose them and to even name them. In fact, you have your Bible in front of you, right? Read First Timothy 1. Go to First Timothy 1. And I think it's verses uh, 18 or 19. And notice what Paul the Apostle said. Go ahead, yeah. That's in verse 18. It says, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with these prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may fight the good fight. Go ahead, now, next like, verse. Keeping, keeping faith. Keeping with faith. That keeping, means keeping with the doctrine. Right, and a good conscience. Of which? Which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regards to their faith. And who are they? Among these are... Hymenaeus, 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 and Alexander, whom I had delivered over to Satan, so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. Did Paul mention names? Yes, he did. Look at Second Timothy four twenty. Since we're right around the corner, Second Timothy four twenty. Yep. He names two others too. What does he say? Erastus remaining at Corinth. Yeah. But Tromepheus. Yeah. I left sick. What did you say about Alexander? Oh, where are we? Alexander the coppersmith. Okay, I'm looking. <laughs> it should be in Second Timothy. Chapter, what is it? 14, yeah. Look at 14. verse 14, what does Sorry. he say? 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his... Okay. Case. Did Paul mention names? Yes. Absolutely. Then is that... Was, God, was Paul motivated or guided by the Holy Spirit? Yes. Was he inspired by the Holy Spirit? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit sometimes inspire people and men of God who are communicators of the Word of God to name names? Yes. Okay. So when a man of God names names, what's the first thing that happens to the man of God? He gets judged. He gets Right? But then, there we go, right in the, in the Word of God. The final authority is the Word of God. There comes a time when you have to tell people to be careful. They're, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. And that there are people that are out there to try to stop your momentum and your motivation. So what you need to do at times is name their names. I did that one time. I got in so much trouble. It was amazing. But I just... What, what did Alexander do? Yeah. Um... He, he discredited all his teachings, judged him, and said that he was in it for the money and not for the truth. And he, and he did, by the way, it doesn't say he did evil, does it? Does it say he did evil, Jason? No, what does just, it say? No, he just named, he names him. No, what did he say? He did me much harm. He did what? How much? He did What kind much, of harm? Much harm. Much harm. He didn't just do him harm, right? He did much harm. So we're talking about people that have outrightly, you know, I mean... They've, they've dedicated their lives to trying to destroy men and women of God. I've seen that happen throughout the years. And I, I know of three situations where I saw that happen. And all three people that were the ones who attacked are dead. And I believe that that's God using the sin unto death to take people home. Because you cannot touch God's anointed. And Moses taught us that. And, and Paul taught us that. You start touching the man of God. Even the woman of God, you start touching them. The Bible teaches, not me, the Bible teaches that don't touch God's anointed. Even David, when Saul went into the cave to go to the bathroom, Saul pulled, pulled down his robe to go to the bathroom. David cut off his, um, the, the um, hem of his gown, right? Saul didn't know it. And then David stood on a mountain and told Saul, look, he said, I had the chance to kill you when you were in the bathroom. And he said, and Saul said, why didn't you kill me? He said, because the Bible says, do not touch God's anointed. When people touch men or women of God who are promoting the word of God and the will of God, they are touching God's anointed. And when they do so, there is a payment for it. And whether it's me, whether it's my daughter, whether it's George, whether it's Rick, whether it's you, 
whether it's anyone in this local assembly, even the members that are promoting the word of God, if you touch God's people and God's people leave it alone and don't fight back, God will take care of the situation. The temptation and the hard thing is for us to not fight back because we want to tell people how right we are. But we don't want to tell them how wrong we are when we're wrong. <laughs> we just want to tell them how right we are when but we're wrong. But just right. as you say, you know, in, done in the right way. The right thing must be done in the right way. Right. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's 9.01. Do we have any other questions, Sam? We're not going to get into Divine Essence tonight. We'll save it for Friday. 9.02. And, uh, okay. Counting down. Uh, Jim, would you like to say anything? Give it, give it to Jim, Robert. Tell us your name and where you're from. Uh, Jim Havoc. Uh, where am I? Pennsylvania or Jersey? I'm not sure. You're uh, from America. And no, you're from the royal family of God. Very good. You're from heaven. Your citizenship is from heaven. Tell me, Pastor, are millennial Christians in heaven going to be the same creatures as Old Testament saints? And we'll be body of Christ will be yes. difference there? Am I correct in that thinking? Yep. Absolutely. Millennial saints will be like the Old Testament saints. Only those in the church age are members of the body of Christ. Because once the last, once the last person of the body of Christ is saved, the rapture takes place, and then we go back to the tribulation period, which are the seven years, if I was getting into eschatology, which is the study of the end times, those are the seven years God owes Israel, God promised Israel 490 years of prosperity, and, uh, and uh, that he would be by, the, by their side as his God. He gave them 483, he still owes them seven, the seven years is going to be the seven year of tribulation where the Jews are now God's people on the earth, not the church, because the church has been gone in the rapture. So now the church is missing for seven years. The Jews go back to being God's people. Now, after when Christ comes back, there are going to be people that start off the millennial reign. All of them are going to be believers, males and females, but they have babies, males and females. Some of those babies become unbelievers. The Bible says that the amount of unbelievers is like the sand of the seashore. That there's going to be so many unbelievers during that time that are going to go against God because, you know what? God has given them everything they wanted. The millennial, the millennial reign is a time of prosperity. And even though God blessed them, they're going to turn on him. And then when, God, when the Lord comes back after the, the millennial reign, they're going to be alive on the earth. But there's going to be millions of people who are going to be unbelievers. They're going to turn against God, turn against the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to come back and consume them once again. But the ones that are saved during that time, they're going to be members of the, they're going to be like the Old Testament saints. They don't have the filling of the Spirit. They don't have the mystery doctrine of the church age. They're not believer priests. They don't have all the things that we have in the church age. We are a part, whether you believe it or not, of the greatest dispensation of all dispensations. We don't earn it or we don't deserve it. But we're going to be greater than the Old Testament saints. We are the bride of Christ. The Bible says when the Lord Jesus Christ becomes married to us, the Old Testament saints and the millennial saints are going to be the guest at our wedding. But we're going to be the bride. And he's going to be the bridegroom. And they are going to be the guest. And so I'm grateful that God has chosen me to be a part of this dispensation of the church because I loved being the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was Amen. a lot of information I just learned right here. <laughs> Is that good? That was really good. <laughs> All right. Any others? In, uh, no, just before right. I close, I just wanted to say, like, when we were reading in John today, John um, 13, yeah. I thought it was kind of cool how right after Jesus Christ was being betrayed by Judas, he was talking about love. Yeah. And it's, that's you know, good. something that's kind of points You're to You're getting very attitude. smart, you know. I'm going to be the new pastor of Grace Bible Church after I poison you. <laughs> well, you're going to have to no, dress up it, like a guy. I thought it was cool, like, just like right after that's he good was point. being betrayed, the worst thing that he had to deal with right there. That's and good then point. immediately he talks about love. Talks and about I think love. that should be our attitude, you know, even that's every a great, day that That's we a live. great, great point. Give me a kiss. You get all good points from me. <laughs> that's good. Not all good points. When you tell me to go to bed because it's past my bedtime, <laughs> that's not a good oh, point. Oh, it is. <laughs> All right. Go. All right. We got DC. 
the deacon of charisma. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for another night spending with you, learning about you. I pray that you bless each one of us, Lord, and bring us home safety, Lord, and bless those in the internet, and guide them and strengthen them, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not, it's not much more powerful than this, Mike.